Chapter Six of the Vocation of the Scholar. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Vocation of the Scholar by Johann Gottlieb Fichte, translated by William Smith, eighteen sixteen to eighteen ninety six. Chapter Six examination of rousseau's doctrines concerning the influence of art and science on the well-being of man the combating of error is of no important advantage in the discovery of truth if truth be once derived by just deduction from its essential principles everything opposed to it must necessarily and without express refutation be false and if the whole path which must be traversed in order to arrive at certain knowledge lie clear before our view we can at the same time easily observe the byways which lead from it towards erroneous opinions and shall even be able readily to indicate to every wanderer the precise point from which he has gone astray for every truth can be derived only from one fundamental principle what the fundamental principle is upon which each problem of human knowledge may be solved it is the providence of a fundamental philosophy to declare how each principle should be followed out to its consequences universal logic must teach and thus the true as well as the false way is easily ascertained but the consideration of opposite opinions is of great value in imparting distinct and clear views of discovered truth in comparing truth with air we are obliged to note with greater accuracy the distinctive marks of both and our conceptions of them acquire greater precision and greater clearness I now avail myself of this method to give you a short and plain view of what has been already brought forward in these lectures. I have placed the vocation of man in the continual advancement of culture and in the harmonious development of all his faculties and wants, and I have assigned to that class whose duty it is to watch over the progress and harmony of this development the most honorable place in human society no man has opposed this truth more decidedly on more plausible grounds or with more powerful eloquence than rousseau to him the advancement of culture is the sole cause of all human depravity according to him there is no salvation for man but in a state of nature and what indeed flows most accurately from his principles that class of men who most effectually promote the advancement of culture the scholar class is at once the source and center of all human misery and corruption such a theory has been propounded by a man who has himself cultivated his mental faculties in a very high degree with all the power which he acquired by this superior cultivation he labored wherever it was possible to convince mankind of the justice of his doctrines to persuade them to return to that state of nature which he so much commended to him retrogression was progress and that forsaken state of nature the ultimate end which a now marred and perverted humanity must finally attain thus he did precisely that which we do he labored to advance humanity according to his own ideas and to aid its progress toward its highest end he did that precisely which he himself so bitterly censured his actions stand in opposition to his principles the same contradiction reigns in his principles themselves what excited him to action but some impulse of his heart had he examined into this impulse and connected it with that which led him into air he would then have had unity and harmony both in his actions and in his conclusions if we can reconcile the first contradiction we shall at the same time have reconciled the second the point of agreement of the first 
is likewise that of the second. We shall discover this point. We shall solve the contradiction. We shall understand Rousseau better than he understood himself. And we shall then discover him to be in perfect harmony with himself and with us. Whence did Rousseau derive this extraordinary theory, maintained indeed partially by others before him, but as a whole so completely opposed to the general opinion? Did he deduce it by means of some higher principle? Oh, no! Rousseau did not penetrate on any side to the confines of human knowledge. He does not appear ever to have proposed such a question to himself. What truth he possessed, he founded immediately on his feelings, and his knowledge has therefore the faults common to all knowledge, founded on mere undeveloped feeling. That it is partly uncertain, because man cannot render to himself a complete account of his feelings. That the true is mixed up with the untrue, because a judgment resting upon feelings alone regards as of like meaning things which are yet essentially different. Feeling does not err, but the judgment errs, because it misinterprets feeling and mistakes a compound for a pure feeling. From these undeveloped feelings, upon which Rousseau grounds his reflections, he proceeds with perfect justice. Once in the reign of syllogism, he is in a harmony with himself, and hence carries the reader who can think with him irresistibly along. Had he allowed his feelings to influence the course of his inquiries, they would have brought him back to the right path from which they had first led him astray. To have erred less than he did, Rousseau must have possessed either more or less acuteness of intellect than he actually did possess. And so he who reads his works, in order not to be led astray by them, must possess either a much higher or a much lower degree of acuteness than he possessed. He must either be a complete thinker or no thinker at all. Separated from the great world, and guided by his pure feeling and lively imagination, Rousseau had sketched a picture of society, and particularly of the scholar class, with whose labors he especially occupied himself, as they should be, and as they necessarily must and would be, if they followed the guidance of common feeling. He came into the great world, he cast his eyes around him, and what were his sensations when the world and its scholars, as they actually were, met his gaze? He saw at its most fearful extreme that scene which every one may see who turns his eyes toward it. Note, the reader must bear in mind that these lectures were delivered in 1794, during the revolutionary epoch in France. End of note. Men bowed down to the dust like beasts, chained to the earth regardless of their high dignity and the dignity within them, saw their joys, their sorrows, their whole existence dependent on the satisfaction of base sensuality, whose demands rose higher with every gratification, saw them careless of right or wrong, holy or unholy, in the satisfaction of their appetites, and ever ready to sacrifice humanity itself to the desire of the moment, saw them ultimately lose all sense of right and wrong, and place wisdom in selfish cunning and duty in the gratification of lust, saw them at last place their glory in this degradation, and their honor in this shame, and even looked down with contempt on those who were not so wise and not so virtuous as themselves, saw those who should have been the teachers and guides of the nation sunk into the accommodating slaves of its corruption, those who should have given to the age the character and wisdom and the earnestness assiduously catching the tones of the reigning folly and the predominant vice, heard the mask for the guidance of their inquiries, not, is it true, is it good and noble, but will it be well received? Not what will humanity gain by it, but what shall I gain by it? 
how much gold and what prince's favor or what beauty's smile saw them even look on this mode of thought as their highest honor and bestow a compassionating shrug on the imbeciles who understood not like them to propitiate the spirit of the time saw talent and art and knowledge united in the despicable task of exhorting a more delicate enjoyment from nerves already wasted in pleasure or in the detestable attempt to palliate or justify human depravity to raise it to the rank of virtue and willfully demolish everything which yet placed a barrier in its way so at length and learned it by his own unhappy experience that those unworthy men were sunk so low that the last misgiving which truth once produced within them the last doubt which its presence called into being having utterly disappeared they became quite incapable of even examining its principles that even with the demand for inquiry ringing in their ears they could only answer enough it is not true we do not wish to be true for it is no gain to us he saw all this and his strained and disappointed feelings revolted against it with deep indignation he rebuked his age let us not blame him for this sensibility for it is the mark of a noble soul he who feels the godlike within him will often thus sigh upwards to eternal providence these then are my brethren these the companions whom thou hast given me on the path of earthly existence yes they bear my shape but our minds and hearts are not related my words are to them a foreign speech and theirs to me i hear the sound of their voices yet there is nothing in my heart to give them a meaning o eternal providence wherefore didst thou cause me to be born among such men or if it were necessary that i should be born among them wherefore didst thou give me these feelings this longing presentiment of something better and higher why didst thou not make me like them why didst thou not make me base even as they are i could then have lived contentedly among them ye do well to reprove his melancholy and censure his discontent ye to whom all around you seems good ye do well to praise the contentment with which ye derive enjoyment from all things and the modesty with which ye accept men as they are he would have been as modest as ye are had he been tormented with as few noble aspirations ye cannot rise to the conception of a better state and for you truly the present is well enough in this fullness of bitter feeling rousseau was now incapable of seeing anything but the object which had called it forth sensualism reigned triumphant that was the source of the evil he would know how to destroy this empire of sensualism at all hazards cost what it might no wonder that he fell into the opposite extreme sensualism shall not reign it does not reign when it is destroyed when it ceases to exist or when it is not developed when it has not acquired power hence rousseau's state of nature in the state of nature the faculties peculiar to man shall not be cultivated they shall not even be distinguished man shall have no other wants than those of his animal nature he shall live like the beasts on the meadow beside him it is true that in this state none of those crimes would find a place against which rousseau's feelings so strongly revolted man would eat when he hungered and drink when he was athirst whatever he found before him and when satisfied would have no interest in depriving others of that which he could not use himself once satiated himself any one might eat or drink before him what and how much whatsoever he would for now he desires rest and has no time to disturb others in the anticipation of the future lies the true character of humanity 
it is therefore the source of all human vice shut out the source and vice is no more and rousseau did effectually exclude it from his state of nature but it is also true that as surely as man is man and not a beast he is not destined to remain in this condition vice indeed would thus cease but with it virtue and reason too would be destroyed man becomes an irrational creature there is a new race of animals and men no longer exist there can be no doubt that rousseau acted honorably with men he endeavored himself to live in that state of nature which he so warmly recommended to others and showed throughout every indication of this desire we may then put the question to him what was it in truth which he sought in this state of nature state of nature has been capitalized throughout he felt himself imprisoned crushed down by manifold wants and what is indeed the least evil for the majority of men but the bitterest oppression for such a man as he was he was often seduced from the path of rectitude and virtue by these wants living in a state of nature he thought he should be without these wants and he spared so much pain from their denial and so much yet bitterer pain from their dishonorable gratification he should then be at peace with himself he also found himself oppressed on every side by others because he stood in the way of the satisfaction of their desires man does not do evil in vain and for no purpose thought rousseau and we with him none of those who injured him would have done so had they not felt these desires had all around him lived in a state of nature he should have been at peace with others thus rousseau desired undisturbed tranquillity within and without well but we inquire farther to what purpose would we apply this unruffled peace undoubtedly to that to which he applied the measure of rest that did actually belong to him to reflection on his destiny and his duties therefore to ennoble himself and his fellow men but how was that possible in the state of animalism which he assumed how was it possible without the previous cultivation which he could only obtain in the state of civilization he thus insensibly transplanted himself and society into this state of nature with all that cultivation which they could only acquire by coming out of the state of nature that sentence in italics he imperceptibly assumed that they had already left it and had traversed the whole path of civilization and yet had not left it and had not become civilized and thus we have arrived at rousseau's false assumption and are now able to solve his paradoxes without any serious difficulty rousseau would not transplant men back into a state of nature with respect to spiritual culture but only with respect to independence of the desires of sense and it is certainly true that as man approaches nearer to the highest end of his existence it must constantly become easier for him to satisfy his sensual wants that his physical existence must cost him less labor and care that the fruitfulness of the soil will increase the climate become milder an innumerable multitude of new discoveries and inventions will be made to diversify and facilitate the means of subsistence that further as reason extends her dominion the wants of men will constantly diminish in strength not as in a rude state of nature because he is ignorant of the delights of life but because he can bear their deprivation he will be ever equally ready to enjoy the best with relish when it can be enjoyed without violation of duty and to suffer the want of everything which he cannot obtain with honor is this state considered ideal in which respect it is unattainable like every other ideal state so is the golden age of sensual enjoyment without physical labor which the old poets describe 
thus what rousseau under the name of the state of nature and these poets by the title of the golden age place behind us lies actually before us it may be remarked in passing that it is a phenomenon of frequent occurrence particularly in past ages that what we shall become is pictured as something which we already have been and that what we have to attain is represented as something which we have formerly lost a phenomena which has its proper foundation in human nature and which i shall explain on a suitable occasion rousseau forgot that humanity can and should only approach nearer to this state by care toil and struggle nature is rude and savage without the hand of man and it should be so that thereby man may be forced to leave his natural state of inactivity and elaborate her stores that thereby he himself instead of a mere product of nature may become a free reasonable being he does most certainly leave it he plucks at all hazards the apple of knowledge for the impulse is indestructibly implanted within him to be like god with a capital g the first step from this stage leads him to misery and toil his wants are awakened and clamorously demand gratification but man is naturally indolent and sluggish like matter from whence he proceeded hence arises the hard struggle between want and indolence the first triumphs but the latter bitterly complains now in the sweat of his brow he tills the field and it frets him that it should bear thorns and thistles which he must uproot want is not the source of vice it is the motive to activity and virtue indolence sluggishness is the source of all vice how to enjoy as much as possible how to do as little as possible that sentence in italics this is the question of a perverted nature and the various attempts made to answer this question are its crimes there is no salvation for man until this natural sluggishness is successfully combated until he finds all his pleasures and enjoyments in activity and inactivity alone to that end pain is associated with the feeling of want it should rouse us to activity this is the object of all pain it is peculiarly the object of that pain which we experience at every view of the imperfection depravity and misery of our fellow men he who does not feel this pain this bitter indignation is a mean-souled man he who does not feel it should endeavor to release himself from it by directing all his powers to the task of improving as far as possible all within his sphere and around him and even supposing that his labors should prove fruitless and he should see no use in their continuance still the feeling of his own activity the consciousness of his own power which he calls forth to the struggle against the general depravity will cause him to forget this pain here rousseau failed he had energy but energy rather of suffering than of action he felt strongly the misery of mankind but he was far less conscious of his own power to remedy them and thus as he felt himself he judged of others as he conducted himself amid his own peculiar sorrows so did humanity at large in his view endure the common lot he took account of its sorrows but he forgot the power which the human race possesses to help itself the last three words in italics peace be with his ashes and blessings upon his memory he has done his work he has awakened fire in many souls who have carried out what he began but he wrought almost without being conscious of his own influence he wrought without intending to rouse others to the work 
without weighing their labor against the sum of general evil and depravity. This want of endeavor after self-activity reigns throughout his whole system of ideas. He is the man of passive sensibility, not at the same time of proper active resistance to its power. His lovers, led astray by passion, become virtuous, but we do not rightly perceive how they became so. The struggle of reason against passion, the victory, gradual and slow, gained only by exertion, labor, and pain. That most interesting and instructive of all spectacles, he conceals from our view. His pupil is developed by himself alone. The teacher does little more than remove the obstructions to his growth and leaves the rest to the care of nature, with a capital N. She must henceforth and forever retain him under her guardianship, the energy, ardor, and firm determination to war against and to subdue her he has not taught him. Among good men he will be happy, but among bad, and where is it that the majority are not bad, he will suffer unspeakable misery. Thus Rousseau throughout depicted reason at peace, but not in strife. He weakened sense instead of strengthening reason. I have undertaken the present inquiry in order to solve the famous paradox which stood so directly opposed to our principles but not for that purpose alone. I would at the same time show you, by the example of one of the greatest men of our age, what you should not be. I would, by his example, unfold to you a true lesson for your whole life. You are now learning by philosophic inquiry what the men should be, with whom you have not as yet generally entered into any near close and indissoluble relations you will soon come into closer relations with them you will find them very different in reality from what your philosophy would have them to be the nobler and better you are yourselves the more painfully will you feel the experience which awaits you be not overcome by this pain but overcome it by action it does not exist without a purpose. It is a part of the plan of human improvement. To stand aloof and lament over the corruption of man without stretching forth a hand to diminish it is weak effeminacy. To cast reproach and bitter scorn on man without showing him how he may become better is unfriendly. Act! Act! It is to that end we are here. Should we fret ourselves that others are not so perfect as we are, when we ourselves are only somewhat more perfect than they? Is not this our greatest perfection, the vocation which has been given to us, that we may labor for the perfecting of others? Let us rejoice in the prospect of that widely extended field which we are called to cultivate. Let us rejoice that power is given to us and that our task is infinite.